So the question we're trying to answer is, how do we reconcile the fact that the parish of the week and the special dates on the calendar are supposed to share the same theme? This week, the special date on the calendar is going to be the 7th of Cheshvan, which marks the end of when the last person left Jerusalem in order to return home after the tremendous high of the Yom Tov period. And the parasha is Dech Lecha, which is all about the exact opposite, Abraham leaving home in order to get to a place of holiness. So what is the theme of this week and what is the lesson that we're supposed to be learning? Is it about getting closer to Hashem and escaping the things of our life? Or is it about returning to the things of our life because we've spent some inspiring time being close to Hashem? Which one is it? So yesterday we said we're going to learn. So yesterday we said we're going to learn this based on understanding two kinds of systems that a person could engage with or could be involved in as a representative of somebody else. So let's think for a second. If you are to be somebody else's representative, what are the various ways that you could do so? Representative in what way? Okay, so that's exactly the question. In what way? So how could you be somebody else's representative? How could you, let's put it very simply, uh, under what circumstances could you do something on somebody else's behalf? A bill of divorce. <laughs> it's a very optimistic. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's true. If they gave you the Correct. authority. Oh, there you go. So, so you're giving an example, but the principle is if somebody authorizes you to represent them. So what do we call that? If somebody authorizes you to represent them, we shaliach. call that a shaliach, which is an agent or a representative or a proxy. That's one way in which you could represent another person. What, how else could you represent another person? A lawyer can represent you in court. Okay, so that's an example of... So is a lawyer your agent? Or is a lawyer your... He's your defender. So, so how does the lawyer become your lawyer? How, how do you do this? You hire him. You're you're hire lawyer, him, exactly. Sure. So that's the other option. The other option is you could be hired by somebody to do something for them. So those are your two options. Either you are somebody's agent and representative, or you are hired by them to do something. So it could be your lawyer, it could be the gardener. It doesn't make a difference. The fact is you've hired somebody in order, so you're paying them a fee in order for them to do something on your behalf. And the shaliach, the agent, you're not necessarily paying. In fact, you typically are not paying. But what you are doing is you're giving them the power of attorney or you're giving them the authority to act on your behalf. Okay, so the first one is what we call a shaliach. Shaliach is an agent. And the second is what we call a sachir. A sachir is an employee. And it could be a short or long term. It could be a contractor. It could, whatever it is. But it's a person who is employed to, to do something on your behalf. Now, typically speaking, let's think about this now. Typically speaking, when a person is a sachir, in other words, when a person, when you're hiring somebody to do a particular job, <clears throat> okay, so typically speaking, the, 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 the usual way that a sachir works is you've got a, an item that needs to be attended to. So it could be, for example, you want to paint your house. So now you're hiring this person to paint your house. So in all likelihood, one of two things is going to happen with a sachir. Either the sachir is <coughs> going to be working in your immediate environment, or at the very least, even if they're not in your immediate physical proximity, they are going to be working with things that are yours. So let's say you own an apartment down at the coast, and you hire somebody, and their job is to come in once a week and to spruce up and clean the apartment. So it's not in your physical proximity, but the fact is they're working with your stuff. It's your apartment, and obviously it's your interest, and that's what, that's what they're doing for you. So typically, the soccer is somebody who is the person who is a hired employee, is typically, or hired contractor, is typically either working close to you physically or working with things that are close to you because they're yours and you care about them and you own them, etc. Now, a shaliach is typically not close to you. Why do you appoint somebody to be your agent? Because you're unable to either get to the particular place or do the particular action. 
So for example, one of the classic examples of a shliach that is brought in Jewish law is there's an individual who wants to betroth a woman. I'm using the word betroth specifically because nowadays when you stand under chuppah, the whole ceremony is rolled into one. But in those days, there were two distinct ceremonies. There was the giving of the ring, which was the betrothal, which was subsequently followed by a chuppah later on. And that's when, that's when the, the marriage was finalized. So here's a guy who wants to marry a woman he is living in Johannesburg. She's living in Cape Town. So he has two choices. Either the most the ideal choice is he hops on a plane and he flies down to Cape Town and he puts a ring on her finger in front of two witnesses and that is called Kiddushin. That's betrothal. However, the Torah allows him to empower somebody else as his agent. That person gets on the plane. They fly to Cape Town and they put the ring on her finger saying these words. Hare at mekodeshes. You are here by betrothed Le so and so to Mr. X, obviously is in front of witnesses, and at that point in time, despite the fact that they are not in physical proximity <coughs> to each other, it's as good as if he had put the ring on the finger himself. That's a shaliach. So typically, when do you use a shaliach? When you are not in proximity. A- another example, right? So let's say that you have the agency for a particular product. So you have the agency in this country for a particular product that is produced in China. So that means that the owners of that line of product do not have to physically be present in South Africa because you are their agent. That's exactly the cup of an agent is to allow you to operate at a distance. So that's the fundamental difference between both of these people are doing something on behalf of somebody else who asked them or appointed them to do so. But there's a fundamental difference. The sachir, the person who's being hired for, for the job, is typically in proximity either to the person or to their property. And the agent is typically at a distance from the person and, and usually doesn't really have much to do with their property. Now the question is, which would you rather be? Would you rather be hired by somebody, contracted to do a job, or asked by somebody to be their shaliach, to be their representative. So you've got to think about this for a second and think what are the costs and benefits of each option before you pick one. So what's the benefit of the sachir? What's the cost of being a sachir? What's the benefit of a shaliach? What's the cost of being a shaliach? Or maybe I should rephrase the question. What would motivate somebody to be a sachir, to, to take a job where you're hired by somebody, and what would motivate somebody to be a shaliach, to be somebody else's proxy? So let's think about it. So what are, what are the advantages of being the sacher? Let, let's start there. What are the advantages? The first advantage is obvious. Money. Okay. Money. Money. So the, the person who's being hired for a job, what's attractive about that is, I'm for sure getting something out of this. I'm going to be paid. That's great. That's definitely an asset. That's definitely an advantage. What else is uh, attractive about, about being a sachir? About being hired? When you're done with the job, it's finished. Correct. But the truth is with the shlichos also, if you're given a particular mission, because an agent could be for a particular mission, right? Once you're done, it's finished. So that would be the same in both cases. So the other, the other advantage of being the sachir is you get to be close physically to the person you're working with. So if you have any questions, you can approach them. They're on hand. You could develop a relationship with the person potentially because you're working in the same environment. It so further business or Correct, exactly. Offer. Exactly. So it could create opportunities for further business in the future because you're developing a relationship now. You're not just simply doing a task. You're actually potentially developing a relationship. So there's a lot of value for the person who is the hired employee in this employment. On the other hand, being the shaliach does not offer you that value. First of all, you're not getting paid. So if you've chosen to become the person's shaliach, that means you obviously either care about them or you care about the mission, but you certainly are not thinking about what am I going to be getting as remuneration because there is no remuneration for being a shaliach. But if you do your job good, well then surely the 
the good deed or the mitzvah. Fine, okay, so there's a mitzvah value, etc., etc. But the bottom line is, and it doesn't have to be mitzvah value. If somebody asks you to be their representative, do me a favor, can you keep my place in the line (laughs) at home affairs or whatever the case is? So you're not necessarily getting mitzvah value out of this, but I mean, maybe you are, but not in a tangible sense that you're going to walk home afterwards and say, I got something out of this. You have to believe that there was a value in what you did. The second thing is that you will be at a distance from the, sh- the Mishalech, from the person who's appointed you as a Shliach. So you don't have that opportunity to develop a relationship, etc. Because physically the reason you're the Shliach is because he needs you to do something in a place that he is not. So therefore if he's not in that place, you can't develop a relationship with him during the course of this, of this mission. But he could be... Sorry. No, go, go. Shil, if, you're, if you're a Shliach with someone... Okay. You already have a relationship. Not necessarily. I, I, I mean, you would expect that, right? You'd expect that there's a pre-existing relationship. Otherwise, why would you choose this person as your shaliach? Yeah. However, it is possible that you could find somebody who you feel is right for a particular job. You were referred to them. You ask them if they'll undertake it. Because they're the right person for the job, they do undertake it. It doesn't mean that you have a pre-existing relationship with them. Are there not times when you do pay somebody... No, by definition, by definition, the minute you pay them, they are called a sachir. They're called a contractor. So, That's the definition of a sachir, that they're being paid. The so definition of a shaliach is they're not being paid. What happens with a the bet then when you're having a, a shaliach to give a, give a bill of divorce to a woman? You still have to pay them? You pay the base then, you don't pay yes. the shaliach. Oh, you're paying the authority. You're paying the authority that's produced the get and is running the process of the divorce, but you don't pay the agent who's representing the husband oh. in order to deliver the divorce. Okay, so by definition, a shaliach is not paid and a sachir is paid. Okay, in other words, once you get paid, you are now called a sachir. There's no other other way to look at it. So, <clears throat> so what's the attraction? What's the advantage of being a shaliach? Think about it. You know, a sachir, I can see the, I can see the benefit. I'm going to get something out of it. I'm going to, I'm going to be paid. I'm going to have a, an opportunity to, to shadow this particular business person because I'm now working in their environment. What is the advantage to being a shaliach? Okay, so clearly what's happening over here is that the headspace of the person who chooses to be a sachir versus the headspace of the person who chooses to be a shaliach is very different. The individual who wants to be a sachir is thinking about who? Themselves, right? Think about themselves. How much are you going to pay me? What are the terms of my contract? Where am I going to have to work? What am I going to have to do? How long is it going to take? So the orientation of a person who's signing up as an employee, even if it's a short-term contract, is they're thinking about me. Whereas if a person chooses to be a shaliach, that tells you that they're thinking about who? I think about the Meshaleach, whoever it is who needs this particular task to be fulfilled. That's obviously my priority. That's why I'm volunteering, because I'm not thinking about me and what I'm going to get out of it. I'm thinking about the value of the mission or the importance of the person who's giving the mission or the office that I represent, whatever. And that's actually what motivates me. So the value of the person who is a, a, a Sakhir, their value is for themselves the value of the person who is a shaliach their value is the mission or possibly the person who initiated the mission okay now here's where things get really interesting halachically if somebody is a sakhir if somebody is hired by another person while they are working for that person there's a massive debate to what extent they represent that person in other words You've hired somebody to paint your house. You don't believe now that they are the, you know, the representation of you. So, for example, if somebody arrives at your house while they're painting, and that person sees how they're conducting themselves as a painter, it's not a reflection on you as the homeowner. So it could be that this guy is not a particularly nice person, not a particularly friendly person. I didn't hire them to be friendly. I didn't hire them as my PR person. I hired them to paint my house. So they, there's a whole halachic debate if they could even be automatically a representative of the higher up, uh, of, the, of the boss, the employer. A shaliach, on the other hand, is automatically a representative because that's the role. 
The role is to represent me. In fact, in its most developed form, a shaliach is, the expression that the Talmud uses is, shaluchoi shal adam ke moisoi, and some even go so far as to say ke moisoi mamesh. The shaliach, the representative of a person, is ke moisoi, like that person. And to the extent that we'll say literally like that person. So let's go back to the example. Here's a fellow who has no relationship with this woman in Cape Town. And he's slipping a ring onto her finger on behalf of a guy in Johannesburg. They're however many kilometers apart. And it's considered instantaneously as if the guy in Johannesburg had put the ring onto her finger. And the two of them are now betrothed even though he's nowhere near her, and the guy who is right there standing face to face with her is as if he is invisible. He's purely just Kermoiso. He's a representative of the Shaliach. That's incredibly interesting. Because what that shows you is, if a person is self-interested, like the Sakhir, who wants to know, when am I being paid? Then because I'm so focused on myself, can't really imagine that I represent somebody else. The shaliach, on the other hand, because they're completely focused on the somebody else, they're not thinking, what am I going to get out of this? They're thinking, how can I execute what that person needs done? That could be such a depth of relationship in that moment. A, a moment later, they might have no relationship. They may never see each other again. But in that moment, there's such a depth of connection that the shaliach becomes as if they are that person. It's fascinating. So on the one hand, there's this tremendous physical distance, which is more likely by the shaliach than by the sakhir. On the other hand, there is a greater relational difference or distance because the sakhir is in the space of the hira and therefore is going to develop a relationship, whereas the shaliach is distant from the, the, the mishaliach, the sender, and therefore is not in, an, in a position it would appear to develop that relationship and yet ironically the shaliach becomes so deeply connected to the person who sent them in a way that the sakhir could not achieve it's a fascinating thought take that thought and let's now apply it to the two scenarios one scenario is that you've got people in the Beis HaMikdash at a special time on Yontiv, where there's divine revelation and there are miracles happening because the Beis Hamikdash is a miraculous place and it's, it's the holiday season so there's already a lot of spirituality around and they're rubbing shoulders with all kinds of holy people who have come to the Beis Hamikdash. Compare that to going back home in your ordinary environment in Bloemfontein where, wherever it is that you're going and now you've got to get your hands dirty plow your field, plant the seeds, which one of those two scenarios is going to be the more spiritually enriching scenario? The first one. Well, it depends what you define as spiritually enriching. See, that's the problem. Yeah. Def depends how you define spiritually enriching. When you're in the base Hamikdash, the expression that we use is that you come to the base Hamikdash and you are at that point you're considered to be Lifnei Hashem. That's what you. That's how it's considered. You are considered to be in front of Hashem or in Hashem's presence. We know that the Torah tells us Shaloish Pe'amim Bashanas three times a year. Yei Ra'e Kol Zechurcha. All the male members of your society should be seen in the Beis Hamikdash, which means basically that you had to arrive, that you had to make a pilgrimage. But the Gemara then says. In the same way as you were required to come to be seen, basically almost like Hashem is taking register, you know, and saying, okay, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? You were also invited during that experience to see godliness. Now, we don't know what that felt like. We don't know what it looked like. But we understand and appreciate that when you were in the Beis Hamikdash during this special time, the truth is any time you were in the Beis Hamikdash, but especially during this special time, you were seeing godliness so that would be like being a sakhir the sakhir is somebody who is in the environment of the employer so in the base i'm in the environment of our divine employer 
That's where I am. I'm in Hashem's space. Lifnei Hashem. And when you're close to the person who's employed you for the position, you have an opportunity to develop a relationship with them. That's what happens in the Beis HaMikdash. Now you have a chance to develop a meaningful relationship with Hashem. That's what's going on in the Beis HaMikdash. That's why you go there. That's, that's why it's uplifting. That's why it's inspiring. Because you have an opportunity to develop this depth of connection to Hashem. So wh- why would you go to the Beis HaMikdash? If a person has chosen now to make the pilgrimage, why have they chosen to make the pilgrimage? What's driving them? What's motivating them? Besides the fact that you'll say, obviously, there's an obligation. But, but what's actually motivating the person? Self-fulfillment. Self. Self-fulfillment. I'm going to get something out of this. It's going to be a deeply meaningful experience for me. I look forward to it all year round. This is the time that we go and we, get these, we have these experiences and we, we get inspired and we feel connection. And I feel enriched. Which, by the way is not entirely different to the Yom Tov season. People say, I'm looking forward. I want to be inspired over Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I want to get something out of it. I want to feel uplifted. Besides the fact, obviously, that we also have the items that we want to pray for that Hashem should answer, which is also self-interested. So there's this interesting irony that on the one hand, we're talking about such a holy place and such a holy time. And you would expect that holiness is going to be very much about Hashem, But on analysis, it could very much be about us. We want to absorb all of the value that is available. When a person leaves the base Hamikdash to go home, at that point, they're now like a shaliach. The shaliach has to go far, right? The shaliach has to leave that beautiful environment. The shaliach has to leave their home. You know, sometimes the mission that a person is given is a very trying mission. It's a very challenging mission. It's an arduous mission. And that's exactly what it is to go back home. You know, nobody's holding your hand anymore. Nobody's making these miracles in front of your eyes. Now you're left to your own devices, which is exactly what happens to an agent. When an agent is out in the field, sometimes they have to make choices without advice, without guidance, without being able to reach the person who sent them. And they've just got to make a decision on the fly, realizing that the decision they make is not in their personal capacity. They're representing whoever it is that sent them. So there's a tremendous amount of responsibility. So going back into the world is not simple. It's not comfortable. It's not smooth. It's not easy. And that's exactly how it is. After the Yom Tov period, or after you've been to the, to the Beis Amikdash and had this great revelation, you go back home and it's not easy. Suddenly you feel, oi! I'm on my own over here. Nobody's doing all of those things that are going to carry me and inspire me. So it's less glamorous. And yet, ironically, it's when you step back into the home environment, you step back into the ordinary world, only then do you become Hashem's shaliach. And it's possible for a shaliach to have a relationship with the one who sent them that is so profound that the shaliach could be called kermoisoi. I'm like the one who sent me. Or to put it differently, when I'm standing in the base Amigdash, there's me and there's divine revelation and I am enjoying the divine revelation to the extent that I can. Which means if I'm not a very spiritual person, I might be swept up in the excitement and the energy of what's going on in the base Amigdash But I might not really cap it in a very profound way because I'm not a very profound person. So there's me and the revelation, two distinct entities trying to engage with each other. When I go back home and I start doing what Hashem expects of me to do in the regular world, in the sweat, blood and tears of living, at that point, maybe I won't feel, maybe I won't see Maybe I won't experience divine revelation, but potentially I'm plugging in to the source. That will give us the clue to understanding how we reconcile on the one hand that this is the parasha about leaving home to Israel. And on the other hand, this is the time of the year of leaving Israel to go home. The key to understanding that is this principle that the Shaliach connects to Hashem in a deeper way 
then the sakhir or the person back home doing what is expected of them is at a deeper level of connection than when they're basking in the great holiness of the base amigdash. So we'll unpack that further next time just to understand where Abraham illustrates to us exactly how this principle works. I don't understand 